On this episode of Twill, the Linux kernel has released the latest version with 6.6, and there are a lot of exciting updates in this release. Mozilla has announced that they are finally packaging deb files for the Firefox browser. Linux Mint's Cinnamon is going to be getting Wayland support. Apple has announced that the new M3 chips are out, and we'll talk about why that matters for Linux. All of this and so much more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux. Good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. The Linux kernel has released the latest version, which is Linux 6.6. And naturally, since this show is called This Week in Linux, we are absolutely going to talk about it and talk about it first. So let's talk about the biggest change, and that's arguably the scheduler switch between the CFS scheduler and the EEVDF scheduler. The reason this is important is because the scheduler is what divides CPU time between processes, and the EEVDF scheduler is able to do it more efficiently with less lag and less latency, which is always good. And there's also a new EventFS subsystem that improves memory efficiency. There's new AMD-related additions, such as the AMD Dynamic Boost Control. It fixes for kernel panics on Zen systems, AMD Zen 5 temperature support, and much more on AMD side. Plus also there's some security enhancements for Intel. So the Intel Shadow Stack has been added. Uh, protects against return-oriented programming attacks. Uh, patches work on some AMD chips as well. There's also been improvements for CephFS. So it now supports FScript, allowing CephFS encryption. Also KSMBD is no longer experimental. There's also been some improvements for gaming device support, such as the Google Stadia controller rumble, NVIDIA Shield Controller Battery Reporting, Steel Series Arcix One Xbox Headset, and some more and more and more. Plus, also there's some improvements to some Lenovo laptops, and there's just a huge list. I'll have a link to a bunch of stuff in the show notes so you can check out more. Especially, I recommend the Kernel Newbies website because that is just a fantastic source for information about what's new in the latest versions of the kernel. Mozilla has announced a new official repository for Firefox making deb packages for Debian and Ubuntu. Now this is really cool and kind of weird. The reason it's cool is because Mozilla making Firefox packages for Linux is really good. The weird thing is it's been the default browser for Linux for who knows how long, pretty much forever. and this is the first time they've done it. So why did they take 20 years to finally make a repo for deb files? Well, who knows what the actual reason is, but it is cool that they're doing it. Because previously, uh, you had to download a tarball, which is a tar.xe or tar.gz file, and then you'd have to extract it, and then you have to make a .desktop file, put that into your main menu system, and all sorts of stuff. It's just, it was clunky. You wouldn't even get update notifications and that sort of thing. So it's not a great experience previously. So you would have to use an unofficial repository or the Snap or the Flatpak in order to use Firefox. And for the most part, that's a fine solution. I don't mind the Flatpak or the Snap, but... This is pretty cool that Mozilla has decided to create an official repository for Debian and Ubuntu users. Now, right now, it's only Firefox nightly, but they have plans to add in de developer stuff and the beta stuff and the regular releases as well. But for now, they're just testing it with nightly. So they haven't really said how long they expect it to take to get to the other releases. But for now, if you want to try out this new repository, you can get the nightly version. But keep in mind, that means it's not even beta and there's guaranteed to be bugs of some kind. So just uh, just wanted that you have that note. But I think this is really cool because at some point this will be very useful to a lot of people. But I am still curious why they waited so long. Is it like a marketing thing because so many people don't like the Snap version or what? I don't know. But just to be clear, I have tried out the Firefox Snap in the latest version of Ubuntu with 23.10, and it is much, much better. It used to take like 15 seconds for it to boot for the first time, and then it was fine. But that first time booting was annoying because every time you boot a machine, you have to go through that. Now it's about two to three seconds. So that's fine to me because that's how long it usually takes Firefox to load anyway. So I'm okay with that. And if you are too, then you can continue to use the Snap. Or if not, you can check out this repo for the Firefox devs officially from Mozilla. 
And if you'd like to learn more about this, you'll find links in the show notes. Linux Mint has announced that they are working on Wayland support for the Cinnamon desktop. And this is really cool because starting with Cinnamon 6.0, they will have an experimental Wayland support, which is expected to be included in Linux Mint 21.3. Now, according to Linux Mint blog post, they say that we don't expect it to replace Xorg as default anytime soon, not in 21.3 and not in 22.x, which is understandable because that's only roughly about a year away, maybe six to 10 months, something like that. It's going to happen in 2024, most likely. And that is not a lot of time to completely rebase the display server of your window manager, but they say that they want to be ready all the same. So Cinnamon 6.0 is planned to have this experimental Wayland support, and you'll be able to select it between Cinnamon's Xorg and Cinnamon Wayland on the login screen. And they also say that the Wayland session won't be as stable as the default one, and it will lack features, and it will come with its own limitations, so they don't really recommend it. But you will be able to give it a shot if you would like to, and if you want to provide feedback on the support that they have done, and you know give them suggestions, maybe bugs, bug reports, and that sort of thing, which is really cool. Also, it's great to see that Cinnamon is working on Wayland support because with GNOME having Wayland support, KDE having Wayland support, the WL roots, there's a lot of progress on the Wayland side. And there's always been a question about Cinnamon because up until now, we had never heard of Cinnamon working on Wayland support at all. So it was a question of when Wayland comes around, is Cinnamon going to die? Because at some point, this is not an if Wayland replaces Xorg, it's a when. So this is really good to hear because I'm really happy to see that Cinnamon's continuing because Cinnamon is a great desktop, especially for people who are switching from Windows to Linux. It has a lot of benefits there. So really happy to see that. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, you'll find links in the show notes. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010 and Linstore, industry-leading open-source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open-source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Linbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and Linstore. And also with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fa fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T.com. Apple announced the new M3 line of their ARM processors to be shipped on the Macs. Now, this is really, really interesting information because we talked about this on the last episode of Destination Linux that the M3 was coming out, and we talked about our experience with using the M1 chips because they are pretty impressive, and we wanted to test them to compare and not just be, you know, talking blindly about some topic that we have never actually tried. So myself and Ryan have tried the M1 chips, uh, I use the M1 Max chip for my test, and it's pretty good. It's pretty good. So this is a very interesting concept because we're talking about this in that episode where we discuss the future of Linux with ARM and RISC-V, as well as even the future of Windows and whether or not it might be Linux-based. So if you want to check out that, that episode, we'll have that linked in the show notes. Now, the biggest leap forward in graphics architecture for the Apple Silicon is the M3 chip, as Apple has claimed. They have improved the neural engine, support for greater unified memory, AV1 decoding support, which is really good. And they say that there's a lot of improvements over the previous M1s and M2s, and that's great. But why does that matter to Linux? Well, talk about Destination Linux check that out. But it's also important because Asahi Linux is working to make support for these chips. And so you could use these pieces of hardware with Linux. And this is good because this is a very big change that Apple made. It's not just because of 
there's an arm option or there's an, a risk five option that you can choose from where versus x86 like you can in the pc world the windows side you can go to arm you can go to x86 and all of that whereas apple just has the arm side and in that sense it's very important to support that hardware because if someone who's a mac user wants to switch to linux they wouldn't have that option after a while because if we didn't have support for it then they would just be stuck on mac which it's not the worst thing that would be windows but still having linux as an option is much better and to also imagine how good mac runs on the m1 and the m2s and all that imagine linux running on that at the optimum like optimized efficiency and that sort of thing i am so excited and i can't wait to try asahi linux on these chips as soon as it is ready for full production because that just sounds amazing and if you'd like to learn more about the latest announcement from apple for some reason you can find links in the show notes but also of course the link to the destination linux episode where we talked about this because i think that is a very interesting podcast to check out so That'll be linked in the show notes as well. Discord is now finally verified on Flathub as an official flat pack, which is awesome because Discord is probably one of the most popular apps on the communication side, especially for gamers and pretty much everybody at this point. We use Discord as a part of our community. So tuxdigital.com slash Discord if you want to join that. Also, our patrons get special access to patron-only rooms on that Discord server, which is tuxdigital.com slash membership if you want to become a patron and get all of those perks. But this is really cool because it shows that the Discord team are want to support Linux because there's always been a flat pack for a very long time for Discord, but it was not maintained by Discord themselves. It was maintained by a third party. And now it's officially maintained by Discord, which is just awesome. And a special thanks to all the people involved, like Cassidy James from Endless, Ting Ping, Fianneron, not sure how to say that, and also some other people who are helping get this done. Very awesome to see. And also, again, check out Discord, our server at tuxdigital.com slash Discord. And uh, I'll see you there. NVIDIA has just released the version 545.29.03 of the Linux driver. <laughs> So there's a lot of cool stuff in here. There's actually something very important we'll get to in a minute, but let's first talk about some highlights and new features. So there's experimental HDMI support added for 10 bits per component. GeForce and Workstation GPU support in the open source kernel modules are now certified quality. Also, experimental D3 RTD3 power management support has been added for G the desktop GPUs. There's also experimental support for frame buffer consoles with NVIDIA DRM drivers. There's new Vulkan extensions. But the biggest thing that I want to talk about is the much, much improved Wayland support because NVIDIA was the one of the biggest issues with Wayland for a very long time. In fact, they refused to support Wayland for years or and especially in the... They didn't technically refuse to support Wayland. They refused to support Wayland in the standardized way that people were supposed to do it. They wanted to create their own proprietary message system or... I, whatever, but they eventually got rid of that and are now doing it the standard way. And this is good progress to see from that side because they've added night color, like night light features. They've added support for VR displays, variable refresh rate support, NVIDIA VDPAU support on X Wayland. They've also made a prime render offload support for w Vulcan Wayland WSI and so much more, which is really, really awesome to see. So good job, NVIDIA. If you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. Valve has announced a huge update to Steam VR with the release of Steam VR 2.0. The UI has had a very big upgrade. There's also a very Steam Deck like interface, which is really nice. Also, the keyboard have got updates support with uh, dual cursor typing, emojis, themes, new languages as well as voice chat is now integrated into Steam VR, which is fantastic. Steam notifications are now easier to access and a whole lot more. If you would like to learn more about the latest release of Steam VR 2.0, you will find links in the show notes. If you're a fan of the classic next step interface, then you may want to take a look at Window Maker or specifically Window Maker Live. 
Now, Windowmaker 0.96.0 came out a couple of months ago, and we covered it in the show, but Windowmaker Live is a Debian-based distribution that ships Windowmaker and a set of applications. So this is a fantastic news for Jill, my co-host on Destination Linux, because Windowmaker is her favorite window manager. And if you would like to check it out, you'll find links in the show notes. But let's talk about what's new with Windowmaker Live 0.96.0. Of course, it has that version of Windowmaker, but also it's based on Debian 12.2. It ships with the Linux kernel 6.4. And another cool thing about Windowmaker Live is that it's both installable and also possible to use as a live system. And this is something for people who want something retro. If you are looking for a a time machine for your computer, then Windowmaker Live is an option for that. So links in the show notes. The desktop cube is one of the coolest pieces of Linux and ways to show off the UI and what it can do and that sort of thing. But unfortunately, it was taken out of KDE Plasma a few releases ago. But I have some great news because KDE Plasma 6 will be getting the desktop cube effect back, which is awesome. Now, for those who don't know what the desktop cube is, you can find some videos about it, but it's basically a really cool looking UI of switching applications and switching desktops and that sort of stuff. Now, it's not super practical because it's not as efficient as just a slide effect, but it is fun. And also you can have it where you control it with your mouse and be able to spin the cube around. And it's cool and I'm glad they're bringing it back. So... Thank you very much. It's going to be part of the KDE Plasma dash add-ons repo, so it's not going to be built directly into Plasma, but you can add it pretty easily, and it'll be able to be activated with a shortcut, which is Meta C. It's also, they've talked about uh, some updates on Plasma 6 as well, with pre uh, per-screen color management now works on Wayland. Uh, Spectacle can now take active window and window under cursor screenshots, as well as omit window shadows from screenshots. And KDE Discover got some really nice UI improvements, such as color and alignment changes, a more robust display for screenshots, and much more. And there's a lot of other cool stuff in the news related to KDE Plasma 6, like you can now use uh, the KRunner searching for uh, the overview. You also can have a fingerprint and smart card authorization working for the lock screen with Plasma 6 and plenty of other improvements and bug fixes and that sort of stuff. And if you'd like to learn more about what's coming in Plasma 6, you will check the links in the show notes for more information on that. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network and becoming a patron, go to tuxdigital.com slash membership to do that. You get a bunch of cool perks, including access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux and Favorite t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm wearing right now at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring the notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell. Unless you're going to the Ubuntu Summit, then I will see you pretty soon because that's what I'm doing right now. As soon as I finish the recording, I will be taking myself to the airport in order to get a flight. So that's called optimizing your time by recording an episode right before you leave for an airport flight. Is that optimizing or is that doing it at the last minute? It's a debatable question. So I'll leave it up to you in the comments. To be fair, I also have to do as late as possible so I can get as much news as possible. So there is that. But yeah, let me know in the comments.